Unit 3 Supplement. What is natural deduction? In this video, we're going to try to answer that at the biggest picture level possible. Natural deduction is a method for proving deductive arguments, and it's supposed to mirror natural language reasoning and arguing practices. When we say natural language in logic, we just mean the languages we actually speak, whether they be Spanish, English, Mandarin, or what have you. Let's look at the deduction half. Natural deduction is a method for proving the validity of arguments. That's why each problem is called a proof. It's not a test of validity like truth tables are. You can never show that an argument is invalid with this method. For your purposes, accept as a given that homework and quiz problems are valid. Well, that is to say, all true premises entail a true conclusion. The work then is in demonstrating without any doubt that the conclusion is true if the premises are. We aren't proving soundness, so it doesn't matter if the premises are really true, and we're usually going to leave our variables like p and q untranslated, so there won't be any question of soundness. On the natural side, this is meant to model real-life reasoning and arguing patterns. It's creative and open-ended, yet relies on shared common ground, just like real arguments do. That's kind of a long way of saying there's a lot of right answers to every homework and quiz problem. Proofs are constructed out of a series of inferences, or intermediate conclusions, that build on each other and the given premises. Each step takes you a little closer to the conclusion of the argument. Because you are proving the argument's validity, not even the smallest step can be skipped or assumed. Think of yourself as programming a computer or trying to persuade someone who doesn't trust you at all when you go through the steps of natural deduction. There's a lot of different logical systems that use natural deduction because this is a method for constructing proofs. We're going to use a simple logical system uh, it's often called propositional logic, but you might hear statement logic or even zeroth order logic. In our system, each variable stands for one complete simple sentence, aside from any logical operators like ampersand or arrow. This may limit the ways that we can mirror real life arguing, but it also helps keep the method relatively simple so that you can learn the natural deduction method and apply it to harder logics later on. Logics that use natural deduction get much, much more complex than we will deal with in this class. Propositional logic is a gateway to learning how to use those logics. Even our own propositional logic is not especially standardized across textbooks. So sources outside of Baruch logic may use different symbols for the logical operators. Uh, I didn't learn these symbols when I first learned natural deduction, but I did learn all the same meanings. More importantly, however, other sources may use slightly different meanings for the operators, or they might use more or fewer rules. Please be careful when you are consulting sources outside of Baruch logic to help you understand the homework or do the quizzes. They could potentially lead you astray, not because they're incorrect, but because they're just doing a slightly different system than we are. So the mechanics of natural deduction or the how to actually do it. You start out with a set of givens, things that you don't need to worry about whether they're true or false, they're simply the problem to you as given. The premises and the conclusion. Then we have a set of common ground tools that you'll be working with. First are five logical operators plus the parentheses. Then you'll have 18 rules and two assumption strategies. We're going to look a little bit more closely at these in a couple of slides and much more closely at these slowly over the course of the entire semester. So don't be overwhelmed. The real work is the intermediate conclusions, though. This is your contribution. You'll use the operators, rules and strategies to bridge the gap between the premises and the conclusion they entail. Here's the operators we'll be using ampersand for and V for or it's the inclusive or, arrow for if then, double arrow for if and only if, and tilde for not. We also use parentheses to order our statements. English phrases like either or and neither or are translated with combinations of parentheses and operators. Unless combines arrow and not, 
and only if and if both use the arrow, although they do use it a little bit differently. What about the 18 rules and two strategies? Well, the 18 rules model real reasoning methods. They all have names and abbreviations. The inference rules are mini arguments that are widely recognized as valid. They're little arguments that we've done the truth tables so many times in so many ways that pretty much everyone who does logic agrees these are good rules. We don't need to keep on doing the truth tables and reproving them. We agree with them. Replacement rules are similarly agreed upon, but they're about logical equivalence. Instead of one thing leading to another or entail it, they're about two things that have the exact same truth table. So you can always swap one out for the other and not lose anything regarding truth. The two assumption strategies are a little bit more complicated and it'll be a few weeks before we get to them. But they're indirect proof where you prove that something is true by showing that its opposite entails a contradiction. And conditional proof that mirrors how we assume things for the sake of argument to show that one thing leads to another. Each proof consists of one or more numbered premises given to you, a conclusion given to you, and numbered inf inferences, the intermediate conclusions deduced by you. Proofs also contain citations. These are important. Each inference builds on one or more previous premises or inferences. So we cite the line numbers by using a rule. We cite the rule name. This is going to make more sense with a couple examples. So that's exactly what we're going to see next. Here's a pretty simple looking argument. Here's the premises, P and Q, and if Q then R. And here's our conclusion, R. That bar stands for therefore. So here's our first line. Q is our intermediate conclusion. It's our inference. It's the thing we claim to have proved true. In the citation, we'll demonstrate that we have indeed proved it true. Over here is the line citation, line one. We see Q in line one, and this is where we're getting it from. Simplification is our rule citation. Instead of getting too deep into what the rule is, I'll just say simplification is the rule we have for going from having two things together to having either of those things separately. So here we've got ampersand, P and Q. This rule says, well, we can get just Q out of that. We can simplify this problem. We've now proved that Q is entailed by our argument. Our citation says, hey, we had this thing in line one and we had this rule. We were able to apply that rule and come up with something else. Because we agree with line one, it's a given premise. And because we agree with the rule, it's the common ground that we all share when we do natural deduction. Well, now we have to agree with the entailment that we've shown, Q. Later on, we can cite this line just like it was a premise because it's been proved as sure as they have. Our next line is R, modus ponens 2, 3. You're going to find some rules with some pretty strange names, uh, mostly derived out of Latin or Greek, but we'll come back to it. First of all, the inference, R, and the line citation, lines 2 and 3. And this one, R is the antecedent of a conditional, found in line 2, and Q, well, Q is the antecedent, R is the consequent. This rule says when we've got the arrow and the antecedent, we can get the consequent. If it's raining, the ground is wet. It's raining, therefore the ground is wet. We'll go more over that rule and why it works in a future week, but for now, we can just accept that we've reached our main conclusion. We've used a rule that everyone agrees upon and cited a premise and a sure intermediate conclusion to come up with a main conclusion. Now we're done with the proof. Line four matches our conclusion, so we don't need to do anything else. We've proved this argument is valid. Let's take another look at another example that uses a slightly different kind of rule. Once again, here's our premises and conclusion. They're given to us. In line three, we have this odd looking thing, not not x. 
Well, let's see the parts of it. That's our inference, not not x. Our line citation is just one line, line one. Double negation is a rule of logical equivalence. That tells us that x and not not x have the same truth table, which shouldn't be terribly surprising, since x would go true true false false, not x might go false false true true, well not x would just be the opposite of that second column, and it would be right back to the same as x, true true, false false. That means you can sub one in for the other. This is the same as how uh, negations work in English, of course, but that's obviously not true for every natural language. Our next rule is another of the odd-looking ones, disjunctive syllogism. So let's take it a little bit more slowly. Our inference here involves line 3, which we had just proved, and line 2, and we come up with y. Well, not not x is the negation of x on one side of the or, and we've received y on the other side of the or. This disjunctive syllogism rule is kind of a fancy way for saying, if you have to choose between left and right, and you can't go left, then you're stuck going right. Line 2 says, not x, or y. Line 3 says, well, it's not, not x. So line 4 says, we have to go with y. Once again, we've reached our main conclusion in just four steps. Don't worry, not all the homework problems will be this short or this easy. But our main conclusion is proved. We haven't skipped any steps, although you'll be tempted later on to skip steps like 3, double negation. It's actually quite important not to. All right, this is a bird's eye view, admittedly, of what natural deduction is. It's possibly left you with more questions than answers, and that's understandable. Hopefully, though, as you start to see some of the homework problems, the context of what we use natural deduction for will make the rules itself a little bit more clear. Kind of like reading the rules before starting a game can be confusing until you play a couple of rounds. Then you're glad you knew what the rules were. Hopefully, Natural deduction will work the same way.